Sales force had considered 14 possible takeover targets back in May. That's according to documents reviewed by the Wall Street Journal. The list of targets does not include Twitter, was part of a presentation emailed to current Salesforce board member and former Secretary of State Colin Powell. Self-described hacktivist group DC Leaks took credit for leaking that presentation, which was part of a more than 1,000-page email dump. Of course, Jason, now we're wondering whether or not they were ever interested in Twitter at all. Yeah, and, and just kicking things off, please go change your password. Do not use the same password on every single server and turn on two-factor authentication. Your email has already been hacked. Please use a long password. Use a unique password on every service. Now, looking at to your question, um, was Benioff ever really interested in Twitter? You know, as I said last time I was on the program, it happened to be that he talked a lot about this during his uh, big conference week. So, you know, Benioff likes to mix it up. He's a big Twitter user. I don't think anybody really thought that that was a real uh, acquisition target. But when you look at the list of other targets on here, Box, Demand, Where Zendesk, Marketo, HubSpot, you know, these are all monthly software as a service, pay by the seat, uh, you know, enterprise mm -hmm. software plays that would play very well into what Salesforce is doing and it's clear that he has uh, the ambition to do a roll-up strategy here and it's a brilliant strategy because consumers instead of paying four hundred dollars at the beginning of the year for software that they never use they now pay a dollar a day and you know they pay thirty bucks a month and they can cancel at any time it's really been a revolution in how software yeah. is purchased and that's really what drives the the M&A opportunity John, but then there's Adobe, and this morning, Jim Cramer, when I asked him about whether Salesforce plus Adobe would, would equal a deal that we would actually see, he said, no, Benioff and Shantanu Narayan, who you know well, are both friends, as is Anil Boussri, who runs Workday, who is also on that list. So what do you make of, of all of that, Adobe being a $55 billion company? On, on Adobe and Salesforce, that wouldn't make a ton of sense. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Adobe is really big, probably too big for the likes of Salesforce to swallow. Workday is another question, though. Uh, yes, Anil Boussri and um, and Mark Benioff are very close. But you know, when it comes to whether Twitter was ever really on the radar for them, I, I wouldn't take this presentation as real evidence one way or another. When I talk to CEOs and CFOs, particularly the enterprise, they always have certain targets that are on their radar, they're tracking their stock price movements, they're looking for potential opportunities with those, and then every once in a while something will pop up out of the blue that might have been interesting to them, but maybe not on that list of, of targets that they were tracking uh, and, and expecting perhaps uh, to come up as a possibility. So it could have been that Twitter was one of those, but you know that could also be why, of course, a lot of investors in Salesforce did not want them to pursue any kind of transaction with Twitter, Kayla. Yeah, although Tableau is up about 7% having been included on that deck, uh, guys. Next, uh, this new reports this morning that Apple is gearing up for a new product launch. According to Recode, the company plans to unveil new versions of the Mac at an October 27th event, just in time for the holiday shopping season. Apple has not refreshed the majority of its Mac lineup in more than a year. You can see shares down about 22 cents this morning. Jason, what do you think this means? And and specific in the broader picture too for what the Mac will be to them in the years to come. Yeah, I mean, if you just think about what's the primary computing device for most individuals today, it's going to be their phone, maybe their tablet, and then you know falling back to their desktop computer. And in fact, you know, people are coming out with keyboards and monitors that hook up to Android phones. So in the future, two or three years from now, it's completely possible you'll come to work with this device and just put it on your desk and it will connect to your monitor and keyboard and that's the only device you'll ever own. And so, you know, Apple doesn't seem to really care about the desktop computing environment. They haven't been updating it on any regular cycle, which is kind of unforgivable in my mind because I think there's a big opportunity there still. Uh, people want to upgrade their computers. They want to have these powerful computers and they're just not focused on it. And then you have the whole ports controversy. You know, I just bought the iPhone 7. I got rid of my regular headphone jack. Now I'm using Lightning. New computers are coming out with USB-C connectors and a regular phone, a headphone jack. So it's just a mess. They don't seem to have any overarching strategy here. And, you know, I don't know that besides this little keyboard they're coming out with, if there's going to be anything compelling, um, you, know, though. you know, in terms of innovation. It's the end of the desktop cycle. I yeah, I'm, I'm going to take the other side on this. I think 
this is a cycle where the Mac is potentially more important to Apple than it's been in the past because the smartphone uh, has pretty much flattened out when it comes to growth, even dipped a bit. Uh, and, you know, for every Mac that you sell, average selling price-wise, it's worth about two and a half iPhones. They're also very profitable, and uh, it's been a long time since they've upgraded them, so there's potentially a lot of pent-up demand. So if Apple does well with this particular cycle, given the fact that the iPhone 7 maybe has a little bit more of a tailwind than people expected, thanks to Samsung and thanks perhaps to, uh, to it just being a better tie in the upgrade cycle than people expected for smartphones. I mean, the Mac could be really significant in Q4 and Q1 for Apple in a way that analysts might not expect and really add to gross margins, guys. Uh, that's going to be interesting to watch uh, if, in fact, it turns into a big seasonal gift, especially given what Intel said about the chip cycle in Q4. Finally, guys, big news for Bezos. Just one week after launching that paid music streaming service, Amazon Music Unlimited, company announcing a deal with country superstar Garth Brooks. He is the best-selling solo artist in U.S. history, one of streaming's biggest holdouts. He talked to us on CNBC back in May about streaming. Take a listen. The industry has changed night and day from when we were here. Radio, I mean, uh, record labels were just on the brink of extinction until streaming came, and now whoever has the most catalog wins, which is the record label, so they're back in charge now. Jason, we talked earlier in the week about what they were spending. If you could, if this was really going to be a ten or four dollar product, that's a big fish to land. Yeah, I, I think music's completely irrelevant in the conversation. None of these albums are driving people. No individual artist is driving uh, sales of these products. Unlike when you look at the TV shows, I mean, if you have Game of Thrones or Walking Dead, Transparent, House of Cards, the, the Marvel series on Netflix, people will actually buy Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, HBO based on a specific series. It will pull them in. The artists have largely become irrelevant, and if you look at the commoditization of music, I have the Spotify family plan. It's 15 bucks for six accounts. It's not just for my family. My two brothers and my mom are on it. So we're spending 250 a user to have unlimited music. And I just think it's all been commoditized. And people like Garth Brooks and people who are defending Jason. the album, the oldsters, the, uh -oh, they uh -oh. are not relevant uh, anymore. This, Jason, you're from San Francisco. This is yeah. a sign. <laughs> this is a sign. Wait a second. Here we go. This is a <laughs> sign that. Uh, <laughs> that Amazon is really serious in music. I mean, Garth Brooks was a holdout, but when Amazon talks about their music strategy and their advantages, they talk about the fact that they actually sell CDs and they do downloads, and now they're doing streaming. Garth Brooks was a holdout because of the business side of things and not seeing the advantage. If, App, if uh, Amazon is able to show him that advantage, then they're going to push that to other types of artists that are a little bit on the fence about streaming. So I, I think this is important because Amazon's after this share of wallet play and Garth Brooks's audience, as I'm sure Kayla is about to say, is not just that coastal audience, it's that middle America audience that Amazon really needs for its big time ambitions. I think those people already have Amazon Prime. You know, there's 70 million Amazon Prime members. Sure, you know, maybe this gets them two or three million more, max. I, I don't Jason, think it's relevant. I don't think music is relevant. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm shaking my head here, but that's because there are so many people that I have just heard from this morning that will be signing up for Amazon Prime Music because of Garth Brooks. Our Courtney Reagan points out he sold more albums in the U.S. than any artist except for the Beatles. If you are going to make a big spl splash with your first big exclusive, there is no one bigger that hasn't been gobbled up as of yet than Garth Brooks. Listen, I don't know if Garth Brooks fans all have computers yet. I mean, this is the laggards of the laggards. These are the last people to, <laughs> to, to get online. So let's not, let's not act like this oh is some goodness. huge driver of music or culture. It's not. It's, Apparently it's not nothing relevant. is sacred Young today. People, the PC cycle, Garth Brooks. You're as right about this, music as, an right about this as you were about LeBron James. It's all over. Let's talk about artificial <laughs> intelligence. Let's talk about self-driving cars. This stuff is not relevant. Garth Brooks is not relevant. <laughs> Jason. You always light the fires. Thank you so much. Uh, Jason Calacanis joining us from One Market today.